Good evening, everyone. We can't see you, but we think you can see us. My name is Jerry Lenoska. I'm an associate professor at the Media School here at Indiana University. And I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, panel discussion with um, alumni of the, the school and of the National Association for Hispanic Journalists chapter um, to join us tonight in a discussion about life after IU. Um, I am the founding advisor of the NAHJ chapter here at IU. NAHJ is one of the sponsors of this event, also the media school, and we're really appreciative that the media school has uh, helped us put this event together. We have three outstanding alumni to talk to us about uh, um, their lives since uh, leaving campus um, at, uh, in various uh, years, but um, all relatively recently. Um, and I'm going to introduce them briefly to you. We'll have a chat about uh, let them chat about their uh, experiences both at IU and beyond. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time, I think, to take audience questions. There's a Q&A box that's active um, that you can start typing in your questions now. Um, and I'll remind you about that later and we'll take questions um, all the way up until 7.30. Um, so uh, welcome everybody again. Thank you for being here. I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. The first uh, uh, speaker, we're just gonna go in alphabetical order. Jesse Naranjo, who is a senior digital producer at Politico. He started there as a reporting intern in January of 2020. And uh, he previously interned at the Wall Street Journal's Washington office and at the Post and Courier in Charleston, South Carolina. While he was at IU, uh, as many of you, he was a reporter and editor at the Indiana Daily Student. Next, we have Samantha Schmidt, uh, who is the Washington Post's Bogota bureau chief covering all of Spanish speaking South America. Uh, before she was uh, in charge of the Post Bureau there, starting in July 2021, she reported on gender and family issues for the Post, uh, for the local desk with a focus on LGBTQ community. She grew up in Minneapolis. She's a native Spanish speaker and a dual Costa Rican American citizen. Um, she was a, um, a journalism and Arabic major at IU. And our third speaker is Andrea Vega Yudico who is Assistant Program Officer for the Center for International Media Assistance. She is responsible in her role for coordinating partnerships and consultations on media development around the globe. And before SEMA, she worked uh, covering the White House in the 2020 US presidential election for NHK, which is Japan's public broadcaster. She's advocated for press freedom and human rights around the globe during her time with Reporters Without Borders um, and its East Asian Bureau in Taiwan. She's also written for English publications in China and Uganda. She graduated uh, with a BA in International Studies and a BA in Journalism. So we have some uh, very different uh, experiences, uh, some very different educational experiences and professional experiences that we're excited to talk about. The, the name of the program is Life After IU, but I'm ask, actually gonna ask our speakers to talk uh, uh, as well um, a little bit about their life at IU. How'd you get to IU? What you did while you were at IU? Um, and how did it lead you to where you are professionally now? So we will start off with Jesse. Take it away, sir. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, as noted, uh, I'm Jesse. Uh, I graduated from IU in 2019. Uh, at IU, uh, I started on the IDS uh, my sophomore year. Uh, I covered arts for a while, uh, did student government for a bit, um, general local news uh, as a reporter. Uh, did the same thing my junior year, uh, uh, but I did some editing as well. I edited the news desk um, and uh, using clips from the IDS, uh, I landed an internship for the summer uh, before my senior year in Charleston uh, at the Post and Courier. Um, Without the IDS, that wouldn't have been possible because it's uh, where I got all my clips from. Uh, and I basically spent a solid 40 to 50 hours a week in the newsroom uh, while on the IDS, um, working, doing school work in the newsroom, uh, but mainly working. Um, and I'd set up a really good uh, news foundation. Um, and so I left IU in 2019. Uh, and I uh, went to the Wall Street Journal's Washington office. Um, I entered there for about five months. Uh, so I got to cover Congress, impeachment, uh, did a little bit of campaign reporting in Iowa, which was fun. Uh, 
and then went to Politico, uh, where I started as a reporting intern uh, in January 2020. And uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, there was a hole on the production desk at Politico. Uh, so uh, I was moved into it. Uh, pretty much everything uh, that I've done since graduation um, has been things that I learned while working on the IDS or in journalism classes at IU. Um, so it, uh, working on the IDS is a really good experience. It's basically like professional experience light um, and really sets you up for a career in journalism if it's something that you're interested in. Thanks, Jesse. That's a very brief uh, <laughs> initial uh, uh, remarks from you. Um, let me prod you a little bit and ask you to um, tell us a little bit, uh, describe a little bit about what a digital producer does at Politico, um, which is a uh, born uh, digital uh, news outlet, right? Sure. Uh, so at Politico, digital producer is a fancy way of saying all the things that reporters and editors don't want to do. Uh, so that means everything from publishing stories. My team publishes every story that Politico and its subscriber ser service uh, uh, put out. Um, I copy edit and fact check stories. I attach art to stories. Uh, also like adding enhancements to stories. So like embedding a video, um, adding secondary art. Uh, basically everything that isn't writing and doing the line editing on a story I do. Uh, scheduling stories, uh, uh, same deal with newsletters. Um, Politico has a lot of newsletters. Um, it's one of Politico's big things. So, um, you know, like there's about 20, 25 newsletters in the morning and that's stuff that my team handles. Great, okay, thank you. Really appreciate that, Jesse. I'm sure um, students and uh, other faculty members participating here. We'll have some good questions as well. Um, let us move to uh, Sam. Thanks so much, Jerry. And this is super, super awesome to be here because uh, Jerry and I actually uh, worked together on trying to start up the NHJ chapter at IU, which was like one of the most, uh, for me, kind of gratifying experiences um, in my last, it was my last year, I think, at IU, um, because it also got me connected to this organization that still is so important to me and has really helped me out. Uh, I mean, I, I owe so much to NHJ um, and to IU, of course. But uh, so I'd love to hear a bit at the end about how things are going with the chapter. Um, but yeah, I just to kind of give you a sense of my time at IU, um, I was, yeah, was class of 2016. And basically my first day there, I was in the IDS newsroom. Like I went to IU almost, um, I mean, I, I wanna say that the main reason was because of the IDS. It was, you know, for me, the, the biggest draw uh, of the journalism school because compared to other, you know, really great journalism schools around the country, I mean, the IDS was the best newspaper I could think of. And I pretty, I started right away as, um, a reporter on the local, uh, I know things have changed so much since at the IDS, but I was a reporter um, in kind of the local metro section. Uh, I later kind of covered the election. I became a campus editor a year later. And then most of my time at the IDS, I was on the investigative desk, which at that point had been re revived by Katie Mettler, who's still one of my best friends and colleagues at, at the Post, uh, the Washington Post. She's a local reporter. So um, one of my big pieces of advice is stay close to your IDS friends because they will not only be your, you know, lifelong friends, but they'll, you know, eventually help you get jobs and uh, also just, you know, help read your stories before you send them to your editors. Um, but yeah, she and I were, she was my first editor. She taught me what a nut graph was actually. Um, and we, and then I, I mean, honestly, the, the next biggest, um, most important experience for me at the at IU was with Tom French and Kelly French. Uh, my sophomore year, I was lucky to start working with them. I basically took their classes all the way through the rest of my time at IU. Um, and, you know, that still, I mean, I, I tell Tom still on a, on a daily basis, I'm, I'm using skills that, you know, I, I hear their voices in the back of my head, <laughs> reminding me to get the name of the dog. Uh, don't just say that there's a dog, get the name and the species and everything, or the, the breed and everything. Um, they, they taught me, you know, 
uh, skills that I think very few young journalists get at other schools, which um, is really focused on narrative, right? I think a lot of people know how to do the bread and butter of journalism of knocking on doors and getting the facts right and calling the police, but it's a lot harder to learn those skills of how to tell a story and how to structure a story. So much of that is still so important for me. Um, and yeah, I, I had a series of internships also, thanks to, you know, IU, um, I, I'm from Minneapolis, so I had a, uh, an internship at the Star Tribune, uh, but I also had an internship at, I did the Summer in London program where I spent some time at Dow Jones Newswires, realized I absolutely hated doing business journalism, <laughs> um, and <laughs> I then uh had an internship at the Tampa Bay Times, thanks to the annual scholarship they give out um, at IU and through through Pointer, I believe. And then the big one for me was uh, I, after I graduated, I went to the New York Times for a fellowship there back when they still had their, their five month, or their three month fellowship, which I got extended. Um, so all of those were really helpful. But actually, I think, you know, the reason I got that New York Times internship was because of uh, a, an amazing program that I'd recommend to everyone here, um, the New York Times Student Journalism Institute. I realize I now work for the competitor, but I will forever uh, be grateful to the New York Times for setting this up with the help of NAHJ. They co -op, they uh, team up with NAHJ and NABJ to do this every year, and they basically send uh, a group of students out to um, uh, different, I think now they do it in New York. When I did it, it was in Arizona, but you spend two weeks basically working with New York Times editors, and they they you know, you get these amazing relationships with these editors, uh, you learn from them. And that for me was like a crucial opportunity. It was only two weeks, but it was as good as any of the internships I had, honestly. Um, and it was thanks to those relationships I built you know, that I was able to get um, my, my internship at the Times. And then I started off at the Post as a reporter on the overnight shift, um, which was grueling and started right a week before the election of Donald Trump. Um, so it was kind of a wild time at Washington, but um, yeah, uh, I always though, from the moment I started journalism in my high school newspaper, dreamed of being a foreign correspondent. I mean, for me, that was the goal from day one. Uh, I was obsessed with like Christian Amanpour and <laughs> um, I really wanted to, to go abroad. My family's from Costa Rica. My, my mom is from Costa Rica and I grew up really close to my family there. Um, and I you know, I studied Arabic in college thinking I was going to try to go to the Middle East, I studied abroad in Jordan. But I basically decided that, you know, instead of doing the whole freelance thing, like so many of my friends have done successfully, uh, I was like, I'm just going to work my way up. And I want to get the, you know, I want to get my chops in the newsroom. I want to work with editors. Um, so I, I did, I literally started from the, from the bottom at the Washington Post on the overnight shift. Um, and then, you know, worked my way up to this job, which opened up last uh, beginning of last year, basically. And it was, I was still kind of shocked that it worked out, but, uh, it's the dream and I'm here and I cover all of South America, um, other than Brazil, basically. So I am, I'm based in Bogota, Colombia, and, um, it's a bit of a great challenge. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, look forward to hearing some questions for you as well. Um, and we're going to move now to Andrea. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Jerry, and thanks everyone who's attending for listening in and tuning in. Um, I clearly am still a very passionate alumni of IU and have my decor everywhere, but um, just a little background, and Jerry had that introduction, but I guess generally both at, at the outset, both like in my life at IU and the media school and now where I am, has always been a combination of the back end of journalism and that combination of international affairs and journalism. So um, like Jerry said, now I work at the Center for International Media Assistance, which is um, housed at the National Endowment for Democracy. It's a lot of titles, but there um, the NED is one of the largest supporters to independent media in the world. So that's what we do. And that's what I do. I work on research and convenings to help support independent media um, around the world. And that kind of started with my experiences at IU and how I got to it. But um, I always knew that I won't, well, actually not always, but where I really got the bug for wanting to blend these two was at one of the media school study abroad programs uh, to Uganda. And I know Jim Kelly's on this call. So I wanna give a shout out to him for running an excellent program 
Uh, we were in Kampala for a whole month reporting on the HIV AIDS epidemic there. And after that, I came back and said, I don't just want to I don't know, do journalism, practice the skills. There's so much more that I want to learn as well. And, you know, um, partner my journalism skills with um, knowledge and foreign policy and international affairs. So that's when I started to blend both of those two. And uh, as I started taking a lot of journalism courses, um, all those great reporting and editing classes, uh, visual communications, I sort of started to realize that what I liked was looking at the back end, right? Journalism needs to, needs to be able to flourish, but for it to flourish, there needs to be press freedom and laws that advocate for freedom of expression and for outlets to be sustainable. And uh, part of that, I was, uh, when I realized that, you know, some of the classes and, you know, that was lacking, I, I worked with Tony Fargo to found the Reporters Without Borders Club at IU. So I was involved at NHJ and RSF and uh, at Reporters Without Borders. It's basically the student chapter of this large organization called Reporters Without Borders, a nonprofit that advocates for press freedom and human rights. Uh, they have excellent resources on digital safety for journalists, security for foreign correspondents, uh, even resources for reporters in the United States covering protests and all that really great stuff. Uh, so it was a lot of advocacy work. Um, so because of my involvement at IU with the student chapter and Tony Fargo's help, I was able to get an internship at the Reporters Without Borders office in Taiwan. So I spent about three months of my junior year uh, during the summer of my junior year working in Taiwan, uh, writing press releases and submitting advocacy briefs to the UN um, on behalf of detained journalists in the China region and uh, East Asia working on that. And that's when I really, really got the bug for press freedom and, you know, sort of like working on the back end and making sure that, you know, colleagues like Jesse and Sam can be able to do their work. Um, so with that, I, um, yeah, I really, I wanted to work on that, but that said, I thought that I needed to get a little bit of journalism experience. I wasn't like Jesse and Sam and that involved at the IDS. I was sort of working on the other side. Um, and I worked at uh, NHK, which is Japan's public broadcaster. It's funny because I never worked at IUS TV. I barely had any broadcast experience and started as a producer there um, covering the White House and the presidential election. Um, and, you know, at the, especially covering all those things during like at the time of an administration that didn't support press freedom and co-opted, you know, what freedom of expression meant. Uh, it was really important for me to, I don't know, sort of take a step back and continue working on the issues that make journalism work. Um, and also fun fact, while I was covering the presidential election, I ran into Jesse in Iowa, which is a really funny uh, moment. We saw on Twitter that we were both in the same like bullpen covering the candidates. And it was it was just like a good full circle moment. Um, but yeah, so after working that, I again realized that there's so many journalists around the world that need the capacity and the training and, you know, people do their work. Um, also, like a, a, at the outset, like. In the, I realized that in the past four years, like since 2016, 85% of the world saw a decline in press freedom. That's just a staggering statistic, you know, and that may be because certain countries have a weak regulatory system or political processes or weak civil society, right? That means that, or even increasing authoritarian influence, that means that journalism and independent media can't flourish in those spaces. So what I do now and what um, I do at SEMA, the Center for International Media Assistance, is that we want to build this conducive environment to make sure that media can thrive. We want to research the issues and bring people together to talk about everything from like how to sustain digital journalism, how to make sure that, you know, the adverti like advertising and big tech are making sure that the relationship for journalism works, uh, digital policy, uh, re innovative reporting methods, all to make sure that, um, we can improve the effectiveness of media development and media efforts in specifically developing countries and emerging economies. Um, that's what I, I mean, that's the organization that I work for. And uh, in that role as partnerships officer, I convene um, our partners and our partners include everything from media outlets in these emerging democracies, journalism associations and press councils, which are a huge advocate for um, independent media on the ground and media development organizations, you know, organizations that focus on the governance aspect and again the enabling environment. So um that's that's what I do. And I kind of just want to conclude with saying that a job like a career in media doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be in the newsroom. Um, I did the newsroom part. It burns you out. And I have so much respect for my friends and colleagues who work in the newsroom and 
I kind of like being on the back end, you know, and it's a little interesting to think about um, working on that side of things. Thanks, Andrea. That's a good note to uh, uh, to pivot and start thinking about uh, questions for you all. Actually, we have, um, you know, uh, even though um, Jesse and Andrea, you graduated in the same year, and Sam, uh, three years, I think, before you, um, you all have sort of uh, markedly different uh, job experiences. Um, Jesse working, you know, exclusively digital, Sam working at one of the traditional, you know, kind of journalistic war horses and, and Andrea at, um, you know, a, a media adjacent, uh, you know, um, sort of advocacy NGO. Um, and so I, I think uh, I, I want to encourage people to, in the audience, to think about those uh, diverse sets of experience and um, start typing in your questions. We have one so far. Um, I'm going to prime the pump with a few questions of my own. And the first one really relates to, uh, well, I think to um, what you were talking about, Andrea, with the uh, um, the state of, of journalism today and uh, the vibe in journalism and in journalism education can be such a downer um, for students and for people in journalism. It seems like there's always depressing news um, that that's out there. So. Um, how does it feel, though, in uh, the organizations and the newsrooms that you're in right now, uh, kind of living through that vibe? And um, what can you tell us that gives us hope and uh, will make us feel better, uh, you know, about some of the, the negative narratives? And we'll start, I'll, I'll call on you. We'll start, we'll go from the top again, starting with Jesse. Of course, that's a hard question. Yeah, that's a tough one, uh, especially because like the past couple of years, I haven't really like been in like in a physical newsroom. So I'm, it's like kind of tough to like tell the like get a full reading of like the vibe, I guess, need a mm. more representative sample. Uh, yeah, uh, I definitely see a lot of the people I work with really burnt out. Um, the the job I do at, like as a producer is like particularly a, a burnout job uh, my team has like pretty significant turnover um what can i say that's hopeful <laughs> about that um you know something jesse um if if you're true to yourself about what you want to do um you'll even if even if you're not making a ton of money uh, and uh, like work might be tough, um, if you enjoy what you're doing, um, you're much less likely to get burned out. Um, if you don't stick up for yourself uh, and kind of let yourself get moved around like personnel um, and aren't like into things or passionate about journalism at all, uh, then um, you won't have the same outcome, I guess. Mm -hmm. Can I, I'm going to uh, stick a pin in that question for Sam and Andrea for a second, and I want to follow up with you, Jesse, about the, the, um, your pandemic experience, um, this whole, uh, you know, working virtually, um, and the idea of disconnectedness. How, can you talk to us a little bit about how, how your experience has been, um, coming into the workforce and working in journalism during, um, you know, the worst, um, uh, year, you know, months and years of, of the pandemic? So for what I do specifically, it was actually a pretty, uh, I hate to say a natural transition, but work from home started the same weekend that I was put on the team that I'm on. Um, and my team does everything uh, online. Like there's no in-person strategizing. Uh, everything is over Slack or Outlook. Uh, like we get stories through Outlook, we claim them in Slack, uh, and then we obviously produce them in a CMS. Uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was a bit isolating at first, um, transitioning into a job where I didn't know anyone on the team. Uh, and I wasn't as, especially as an intern getting much FaceTime in the newsroom because no one was in the newsroom. Uh, but it, I don't, it kind of turned itself around pretty quickly. Um, cause it turned out that no one in the newsroom talked to anyone on my team to begin with. So um, 
it, it just kind of made itself work, I guess. Um, a, a piece of it is that uh, it wasn't entirely clear whether I could stay employed. Um, so I was much more willing to uh, just kind of do what I was told. And this, it worked out pretty well. Uh, it, was, it was busy at first, uh, just kind of sitting at the computer and not moving. Uh, but being able to clock out at a certain point definitely helped. Okay, thank you. I think uh, I know we definitely gonna have some follow up for you. Um, a questioner definitely wants to ask you about newsletters at Politico. So we're gonna come back to that. Um, okay, so thinking about that question about kind of the overall vibe, uh, Sam, what, what would you have to uh, to offer on that one? Yeah, and I guess I, I, when we're talking about vibe, are you talking about the vibe for journalism, um, or in, in terms of like in terms of burnout, and in terms of what it's like to be in a newsroom? Yeah, right now? and I guess I would, uh, you know, I uh, I would say there's uh, kind of a competing, uh, there are competing vibes with journalism. It seems like um, almost for every negative um, thing you hear about the field of journalism, then you hear uh, you know a lot of rhetoric about well, we're entering a golden age for journalism with all these new opportunities and outlets and so forth. So I'm just kind of curious how you're negotiating that as a, you know, a relatively young professional. Yeah. I mean, I really do feel like I've gotten lucky uh, because, you know, I, I've, I have friends who have very different experiences at local news outlets where, you know, they're, they're low on resources and they're overworked and underpaid. And, you know, I've been in some of those newsrooms as an intern and know what it's like to feel like you're kind of in a shell of a place where how it once was, you know, I think I've been lucky to be at the post at a time when we've been growing quite a bit, when there are resources, when, you know, you can raise your hand and, and pitch a story in, you know, I remember I, I, when I was working on the local desk, I pitched a story in Argentina and they said, yes, like you have resources to travel, resources to do that kind of work. You're not, constantly worried about losing your job because of staff cuts. Um, but I think in general, we're in a moment of transition as a news industry right now, kind of figuring out what our identity is, especially in the after uh, post Trump era. Um, and I know at the post right now, there's been a quite a bit of restructuring under our new editor in chief. And so it's always kind of, um, you know, like, you know, hard to, and especially, and maybe this is something that people during the pandemic have felt too, when people have started remotely is, uh, kind of the feeling I've had being here in Bogota so far away from DC um, is understanding kind of what that all means and what that means for me and, um, you know, the competing kind of pressures you face to like get traffic and get clicks and get readers um, while also still kind of following kind of the traditional model of like getting on the front page and, you know, um, just covering the news. Like there's all these kind of different, I think as an industry, the biggest constant has been change, right? Like since the moment I started in, in this job, I mean, I've had to kind of relearn things a million times. I've had to kind of shift gears and like figured out, oh wait, so how is it that we write headlines now? How long are they supposed to be? What's the latest strategy? I mean, it's just constant change, but I think honestly, our generation of younger people who have been used to that, who've you know seen their own social media habits change every year, I think it we're very adaptable to those changes. Um, I actually feel like some of my friends who've started the post in recent years, like as interns or on the overnight shift, like people who just got out of college have been really resilient during the pandemic in part because they're used to being online and they're used to kind of having to, you know, adapt. Um, so I just think you have to use that to your advantage. And uh, the biggest thing that has helped me through this all and all that change is having community at the place where you work. Um, I could not stress that enough. I mean, I, I said it about the IDS. I'll say it about wherever you are as an intern or, the, or as a staffer. I think like, for example, we have uh, uh, a, a couple embarrassing Slack groups um, that I'm a part of. One of them we call uh, Shine Theorists. It's a bunch of young women, a bunch of us who actually started around the same time as either as interns or as we're friends. And there are some Hoosiers in there, but uh, we follow this whole idea of Shine Theory, which is like, if you shine, then I shine. We have to help each other out. We know we celebrate each other's successes. Uh, you know, we constantly shout out, you know, so-and-so had a front page story today. Like we constantly are asking like, what does everyone think about this conflict I'm having with a source or with an editor or with um, uh, any big decision you have to make? Or can you help me with this lead? I mean, having that support is so important. Um, we have a group called Cafecito for Latinos at the Post, uh, where even just like yesterday, I was asking for 
ideas about the World Cup and kind of, you know, the style, you know, it's having that support, you know, those are also the places where you go and ask, like, what's going on with this change happening at the company? You know, what should I know about this? Like, what does this mean for me? You just need to have that support. And honestly, I find that, you know, you get that support both from mentors, people who are older than you, you know, but also people your own age, because you need to have that kind of, uh, often I, I feel much more comfortable asking my friends, my age to help with a, a story before I send it to an editor, you know, than I would asking like another editor. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think that that gives me a lot of hope because also those are some of the people who are, some of those young people are also the ones uh, really involved in our in our union, for example, and in a lot of unions in different newsrooms that are demanding better work life balance and better protection for people, and um, you know, uh, better pay e equity. And you know, I, I think that I have a lot of hope, uh, and uh, you know, for our industry. And a lot of that is because of the young people and the people of color, and like uh, demanding that we're you know that things don't just function the way they were they did in the past. Great, thank you, Sam. Andrea, what do you think about the, I don't know if you can remember the original question about sort of the, the general uh, vibe or zeitgeist, if you will, of, of journalism today. Um, from your yeah. point of view, you study journalism globally. Yeah, I mean, I just want to echo what Sam said about the community that you have. I think that's so important to, you know, surround your people, surround yourself with people that also believe in what you're doing. Um, that's speaking from my time at NHK as a producer. And also just like, it's very exciting when you're like, there can be burnout, but it's very exciting when you're working on these national stories and you're part of, you know, the national conversation uh, where you do are, where you are supported, at least in my case, I think for everyone here, like a really large outlet that will support you in the story pitches that you present. Um, I had, I grew up abroad. I mean, I'm from Mexico. Like I only, my first time living in the U.S. was when I came to study at IU. And since like when I worked at my three years at NHK, I visited over 15 states in the U.S. And for me, that was like a really great achievement, you know, because I had not had been to like Indiana and Illinois. <laughs> so that's like, you know, I felt empowered by my work that they, you know, believed in the stories that I was pitching about going to Montana and talking about Biden's solar policy, things like that. Um, and then just on the other hand, sort of like reflecting back what I do now, what gives me hope I don't want to make this political, but like we are with an administration that really does believe in believes more in supporting independent media um, at the Summit for Democracy, which is something that we're working at the National Number for Democracy. We have to be plugged into. But last year at the Summit for Democracy, the Biden administration, on, in conjunction with other governments, supported thirty million dollars to support independent media. That's an incredible amount of money, you know, that you would have not have seen like previously, just like generally in like U.S. history because the press and media is now being recognized as like, I mean, it is a value invaluable aspect of democracy. And, you know, when democracy is under threat, whether it's in the United States or abroad, you need to have that sort of support, like whether financial or otherwise uh, to independent media. So it does give me hope that, you know, governments like not just the US, but like Sweden and Switzerland, they are increasing their, the amount of uh, financial aid that they commit to media. So that for me, that's very exciting. Great. Yeah, we're all following those uh, sorts of initiatives with uh, with great interest. Let me uh, turn to some of the um, questions that are cropping up in the Q and A um, box here. I'm going to start with a student question, um, uh, particularly of interest uh, regarding uh, IU and how uh, the university and the media school prepared you or helped prepare you for international travel and international jobs. No, I start yeah, go ahead, Sam. Um, yeah, I mean, I like I did quite a bit of international reporting when I was at IU. Um, I actually went my freshman year to China through um, the what did they call it? It was some spring. It was like your spring break uh, when you when you, you could take a class your second semester and go to a country for your spring break. I think they had it in Japan and in London and a few other places and. Uh, my, my freshman year and I went to Beijing and I actually um I had a, actually a Chinese roommate at the time and I remember like visiting her high school in Beijing and um doing a story about uh you know kind of the the intense preparation that international students um have you know to go to IU like so from basically my you know my first year at IU I was doing international reporting and a lot of the 
you know, and of course I, I did study abroad in Jordan and it was, while it was not a journalism um, uh, program, I, I did like, you know, all the skills I had already, I actually used to on my own, just go up to some refugee camps on the, on the Syrian border um, and do some reporting that I later actually used um, for a class uh, with Joe Coleman my senior year, where I kind of worked on these stories that I've reported and published in a few different outlets. Um, I had that summer in London um, that, you know, just taught me what it was like to be in a newsroom in a different country and have to deal with like the cultural differences. Uh, so, I mean, every year basically, but, but even when in the, you know, even for those who don't uh, take some of, you know, don't have the opportunity to go abroad, like, I mean, everything I do here are, it's just, it's the same kind of skill you, you, you need for a story in the U S um, I think it just involves a certain level of adaptability and also, you know, in some cases, language skills, in some cases, kind of uh, cultural skills. And, you know, I think for those of us who are uh, Latino in particular and who already have so many of those skills, I mean, that's a huge, I mean, for me, like coming here, it was a, it was a natural transition because, you know, unlike when I was in Jordan and I was, you know, barely capable of communicating here, I felt completely at home, like with, um, you know, Colombian culture and with in Spanish and, you know, so few of the foreign correspondents um, in different uh, news outlets are actually from those countries, if that makes sense. I mean, I think I'm one of the first, if not the first Latinas to be a foreign correspondent in Latin America for the Post. So that's something I believe that strongly needs to change. Um, and it is changing. I mean, I, I have friends who are also helping change that. Um, but I think, you know, it's just another example of how your own culture and your own background, uh, your own skills can really help you. I know this was not the question. I know the question was about IU, but uh, I just wanted to throw that in there in terms of like international travel. Um, that has been really helpful for me. I just want to jump in um, to echo the I mean, the resources that Mina School already has, um, especially if you're interested in international travel post-graduation. I mean, the Uganda trip, uh, my also my the summer after my freshman year, which I pleaded to Jim Kelly to let me into when I wasn't technically eligible. Um, that's that's a really that's that's really how you get your foot in the ground. And I know that it you know financially might be a burden to do these study abroad trips, but at least for both Uganda and when I was in Taiwan, I those were essentially, if not completely funded by scholarships uh, at the media school, the College of Arts and Sciences, and thankfully had a second major. So the HLS school also helped, but don't be scared by the, you know, the, the financial burden of that. There will be resources and you will probably get it all covered for if you look for, for those. Um, and then I know, again, uh, Sam mentioned Joe Coleman, but he has a phenomenal international reporting class. I don't know if he still teaches it, but that also doesn't require going abroad. So you learn a lot of the skills and uh, you analyze the skills that foreign correspondents are applying in their work um, here. So there's a lot of those. Um, and then again, like at least with it, this wasn't reporting, but when I was in Taiwan, like that was an internship that I sought out myself. That wasn't something that was offered by the media school or IU. That's something that if you have the connections, like you use the alumni out there, you can just tell somebody, hey, I want to come work for you for free this summer in X country. I speak the language because at the time I did speak Chinese. You know, I have the skills like just I'll be there. Thank you, Andrea. Um, you want to weigh on in, uh, in on this one? Um, Jesse, did you? I, I can't remember whether you uh, were able to take advantage of some of the international travel opportunities when you were at IU. I didn't. Okay, so I'm going to direct uh, come to you with a direct question from the Q and A. Then, in that case, um, which is uh, from our associate dean, actually about um, the newsletters you mentioned. Um, you referred to Politico's newsletters, and um, she's curious about uh, what that means. Can you talk more about the details of the newsletters? What kind of uh, uh, subjects they cover, and what exactly is the work that you do for the newsletters? Sure. Uh, so Politico has, uh, let me back up. Uh, so a, a lot of the work that Politico does is behind a paywall. Um, you don't see it because it's like a really fancy paywall. That's on, it's, it's basically a different site. Um, and that's what a majority of the people who work at Politico work on. Uh, they don't work on stuff that's on the consumer.com site. Uh, stories might transition between the two. Um, but the subscriber stuff is mainly policy focused. It's essentially a trade publication. 
Uh, so there are 18 policy verticals uh, covering everything from agriculture to energy policy, uh, cybersecurity, trade, sustainability, um, federal spending. Um, and then we have offices in four states and Canada. Uh, so California, Florida, New Jersey, New York. Um, each of those policy verticals has at least one newsletter a day, um, some of them more. Uh, and because my team is tasked with uh, producing and publishing pretty much all of those newsletters, uh, uh, basically we copy edit them. Uh, we check that the people who filed them didn't mess up the formatting. Uh, uh, we're like basically a cross between like a copy editor for the newsletter and tech support uh, for people who don't know how to use the CMS. Uh, so uh, the people on my team who work really late, I've worked uh, shifts ranging from 4.30 a.m. to ones that end at midnight. Uh, so when my team signs off before they do, the people that work until midnight usually get the newsletters the, the night before they go out. Uh, and produce them to the best of their abilities before their shift ends, uh, which means fact checking them really quickly, uh, checking the preview to make sure that the newsletter like looks okay from a formatting perspective. Uh, and then the people on my team who sign on at 4.30 a.m., so four and a half hours later, uh, check their email to see if anything has changed since those newsletters were filed, uh, and then they publish them. And some of those newsletters have free copies that aren't only for subscribers that publish on a delay. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example because they've done a lot of pairing back in the past year or two in terms of free stuff. Uh, for the most part, the ones that are uh, subscriber every day have a, a weekly version. So uh, on Politico's website, you can see there's weekly tax or uh, like weekly score, which is their campaign's uh, vertical. And yeah. <laughs> That's it's really fascinating. So it definitely gives you a sense of um, one of the strategies that some news organizations are using to sort of uh, um, tap into revenues that uh, um, that don't necessarily flow through the regular news product. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, so this is going to be a show of hands question, and then I'll delve into uh, whoever wants to delve into this. A student's asking about imposter syndrome, how you deal with imposter syndrome. How many of you have experienced uh, imposter syndrome? All right, very good. Well, let's hear. So how do you deal with that in your in your professional life? And whoever wants to jump in can jump in. First. If anyone knows the answer to that, I would actually love to know <laughs> um, because I still deal with it every day. Uh, and I especially dealt with it in this job because I guess I didn't realize just how prominent of a job it would be here because it's very, you know, I've always just kind of wanted to be a reporter. I didn't really want to be like a chief of anything. <laughs> um, so getting here and being told I was in charge of an office, which is this, but, um, but you know, having to kind of have a lot, several people report to me and work with, you know, and, and um, be in kind of a position of, of, seen as by some here as like of influence because you're connected to a U.S. newspaper. Um, that for me has been like, like, you know, really hard to navigate and like to feel like I'm the right person. Like, why did they, why did they send someone else? Someone with more experience, someone who, you know, like had, had been to, I'd never even been to Columbia before I came here. Like I, I, you know, I've really struggled to kind of feel confident here. Um, but I'm just kind of, I think it, first thing is accepting that like everyone feels this. I mean, I know because I talk about this with some of the people I admire most, um, people who have like 10 years of experience on me, just know that like everyone deals with it. And it you also have to just uh, remind yourself that like this, there's, you're here for a reason. I'm like, okay, uh, obviously they wouldn't have said like the, the post, they're not idiots. Like I didn't convince anyone of anything or like, you know, they sent me here for a reason. And, uh, you know, after things work out enough times, you start to say like the next, I even thought about this today. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get the story done in time before going to this panel. But I was like, I, I've done it before. I'll be sure it'll happen again. Like you just have to remind yourself that one time when I had even, even less time to finish a you know, to meet a deadline, it worked out. So it'll work out this time. Um, you, it's just a kind of a mental uh, game you have to play. But I think it's, you know, having that support of, of people around you, and, uh, it really helps. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, 
How about you, Jesse? How have you dealt with the uh, the imposter syndrome when it when it strikes? Honestly, uh, the motto I go with is like "fake it until you make it." At least, like in terms of your confidence, not the actual work product. Uh, but uh, I've like realized that I didn't feel like. I should be doing whatever I was doing in the moment uh, and just kind of pretended like I like should have been there, if that makes sense. Uh, like uh, writing a story that I, it like seems a little bit more serious um, than like anything I would usually cover. Um, basically like telling yourself like, no, like there's a reason that you're doing this and like it's a challenge. I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know a good answer. Well, I'm, I'm 57. I still, uh, have occasional bouts of imposter syndrome. So uh, um, yeah, I don't have the answer either. <laughs> what do you think, Andrea? I agree with both of that. Um, I am faking it till I'm till I make it. Um, I think, you know, you have to trust that you're in the position that you are because the people that hired you believe in you. Um, you're also in the spaces that you are, whether that's like reporting in Iowa or in my case, when I really felt it was, um, UNESCO has like an annual World Press Freedom Day, like large celebration. And this year it was in Uruguay. And so my like SEMA sent me to put on a bunch of events and, you know, talk about this. And I'm sitting there like, I shouldn't be here. Like all these people have 30 years on me. Like it, you know, but you're like, and then you have to check yourself, right? And you're like, okay, no, I'm here because my team, my bosses, the people around me uh, believe in me. And, you know, like you are there to offer something, like, especially as a young professional, you think that you're, you know, just because you're young, you're not adequate enough in that space, but you are right. Because you're there because someone believed in you. Um, and again, surround yourself by really great friends and colleagues and they'll be your support system. Can I also just add that, like, remember that actually sometimes your youth is a massive, uh, advantage and like all of the things that you often think are your, like the things that are going to, you know, people, people are going to know, they're going to know I'm a fraud. They're going to know I'm not supposed to be here. You realize, like, I mean, I've had many people say that they felt more comfortable around me because I was a woman or because I was younger, you know, in terms of like interviewing sources or because I'm, you know, a native Spanish speaker or whatever, like all the things that you think are, you know, maybe uh, like potential, uh, you know, weaknesses could actually end up being useful or because you're younger, you're going to connect to, you know, uh, younger audiences and know how to kind of um, you know, write stories that appeal to them or, you know, how to share them on, on social media or you're, you know, I've had editors be like, wow, you're really good at remembering to do these links and to do these, you know, to write the SEO stuff and all, all the internet stuff that like a lot of my colleagues who are a lot older and have, you know, come up in the industry at a different time, like they're sometimes they're still trying to get the hang of, right? So um, yeah, I don't know, there's, there are perks. Thanks for those answers. Yeah, that the this idea of imposter syndrome, the the, the notion that um, perhaps we are here by mistake, that maybe we sneaked in for some reason, and what if they discover that we really don't belong, is not unique certainly to um, people from underrepresented groups, but um, uh, definitely more acute, I would say. And it brings me to one question I wanted to ask you, which is about the still. Uh, you know, continuing issue of the lack of um, uh, representation in media for certain groups. This this event is uh, we're we're holding partly because this is uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, um, and it's part of um, the NAHJ chapter. NAHJ, of course, at the national level has uh, been doing a lot of advocacy related to the lack of representation in, in newsrooms, which is still pretty terrible in many places. And even in places where there is representation, we struggle with things, uh, racial and ethnic disparities related to, for instance, performance evaluations at the New York Times, which tend to be uh, much more heavy handed when it comes to uh, black and brown uh, journalists, for instance, um, than for their white colleagues. And that that is uh, made headlines um, pretty recently um, because of a study by the News Guild in New York. So what are your thoughts about um, kind of the state of uh, play, I guess, for um, Hispanics in, in news media and, and allied fields? Anyone can answer. I'm, oh, Andrea, you can go first. I was just about to say, look, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> you better get used to it. Um, but it's, 
it yeah and maybe i i i did i mean i worked at a full japanese newsroom and i was the only non-asian there so maybe i'm not the best uh the person most uh, you know that can speak best to the culture at a like national u.s newsroom um but i think there's just especially if you speak Spanish, it's just like, it's such an advantage. Like I have, I didn't think that like working in journalism here in the U S uh, I mean, maybe I was silly for not thinking that I would be using it. Like both in, at the Japanese broadcaster, I was, I was the one, you know, like when we were covering protests or, you know, stories on immigration, I was the one talking to those people. Um, now at my job, defending, <laughs> defending democracy, I guess I'm trying to, um, you know, like it is so crucial to be able to you know, when you speak to our partners and our like the publications that we work with in Latin America, everywhere from like, I'm not going to say where we work, um, but, you know, where we work that, you know, being able to, you know, it, it makes such a difference to like be able to say that I, you know, like I'm, I'm from Mexico. I'm not only can I speak to you fluently, but I understand, like I grew up there. I'm able to see what like why why there's a declining in press freedom there um but generally at least where i am now there's a really big push for diversity and inclusion and not in that uh corporate social responsibility way uh where you know like the the you like the the younger staff and everyone really is making an effort to have more um people of color and latinos in positions of leadership and not just in leadership but also just all across the board right um we want to be reflective of the places that we work in and especially like at a place where we do have a lot of regional like we work regionally we want those people to have experience in the region it sort of goes back to what sam was saying about like you know if you're covering an area you should have that experience in that area but i, I feel hopeful that it's that it's getting better but it you know like i said we're not going anywhere it's, this is something I feel really passionately about in part because I've been involved in um, some of our guilds efforts to, you know, we wrote two different studies. If anyone's interested in reading them, um, they're, I think, really in like eye-opening um, about uh, diversity and retention and pay inequities at the post. Um, we realized that, you know, not only are, uh, you know, uh, people of color underrepresented, they're also underpaid, they're also, uh, there's also a real problem at the post that is ongoing about retention, because a lot of people, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, it, it's in some places, in some cases, uh, you know, because we're, the, some of the areas that are growing in diversity are some of these, like, newer, younger digital, um, like, sections of the newspaper, like audience engagement, for example, that is often where, where we see some of the most diverse steps where you see like, wow, there's actually really great representation on this team, but then there's not good like avenues for upward mobility or, you know, there's not enough support or there's not enough, um, you know, or, or people just end up realizing that they're not being paid enough and they leave elsewhere. Right. And so I think that it's really important to have, I um, mean, you know, I believe strongly in, in, in advocating for yourself in seeking out advice from people, you know, like from, you know, I've gotten advice about my salary from like my male colleagues that are older than me, you know, or I've given advice, been transparent about my own salary with my friends and, you know, trying to kind of help each other out and say like, you should ask for a raise or have you thought about, you know, talking to this boss that said this thing to you or whatever. I mean, um, I think that advocating for yourself is so important. And I also think that, um, you know, in, in some cases, like noticing those things and um, realizing that like, just like, in, in, especially when it comes to Latinos, one of the things I feel most strongly about is that you're often asked to do extra work. You're often asked to, you know, and I think a lot of people of color feel this, you know, in terms of like back reading stories or, you know, making sure that something's sensitive enough or something is inclusive enough. Um, or, you know, in, our, in my case, it's been like translating stories, um, I remember really noticing it in the pandemic because of so many people in DC, so many Latinos in DC were, were dying of COVID in the early days. Um, you know, the, uh, and I remember me and a few of my other uh, Span native Spanish speaking friends were realizing like, how many times have you been asked this week to translate, uh, to help you to help translate an interview or help, you know, um, interpret for somebody. And, you know, I always say yes to those things and because I love doing it. And I, I think it's, you know, uh, but in some cases there are people who do it and they don't get enough credit. They don't, you know, they're not getting extra pay for doing that extra work. Sometimes they're doing it in their free time. Um, and it's just, it's, it's something that needs to be recognized. And so that's one of the things that the guild is really, um, at the post really demanding and calling for. And actually I remember, and I have bosses who have been really, um, uh, kind of respond, um, like responded really well to this. Like, I remember 
trying to set an example, um, you know, I realized I have like a lot of privilege and I want to kind of like change this dynamic a bit. So I tried to kind of encourage a bunch of my friends who are also getting a lot of these requests, you know, let's make sure we document these, like keep track of how many times you had to translate stories uh, for things that were not your own stories. And then make sure that you, in your evaluation at the end of the year, say that, say, I did this and this and this, I did extra work. I helped consult this, you know, friend or this colleague or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, that editors can and bosses, managers can sometimes like really respond well to that and uh, take that into account when they're doing your evaluations at the end of the year. Thank you, Sam. Jesse, um, can you share some thoughts with us about um, about this topic? Sure. Uh, Sam made a really good point about unions and how like a union can actually uh, assemble the data that like can give you a better idea of like what your newsroom looks like. Um, because this is being recorded and posted, um, I'm not going to be super candid about uh, my personal experience, uh, but I will say that I was involved in unionizing my newsroom. Um, and we've learned a lot more about the newsroom in terms of uh, pay equity uh, and other things that we've been talking about um, just from being able to request that data from management. Uh, so yeah, uh, I recommend either working in a unionized newsroom or unionizing the newsroom that you work in already. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate that. I'm an, I'm an old news newspaper guild man myself, so it warms my heart to hear that. Um, okay, so I have uh, some other questions here. Um, this one is specifically for Andrea from uh, Professor Kelly, who says, you mentioned your internship at the Daily Monitor newspaper in Uganda, a country ruled by the same president for 37 years now, as being helpful in understanding the importance of support for independent journalism from international support organizations. Would you please talk more about SEMA's support for newspapers, but especially online publications that operate under threat of authoritarian governments, like in San Salvador, Nicaragua, or other Latin American countries? Yeah, definitely. So, um, like, because, like I said, I mean, this is being recorded, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about the, you know, the, the specific organizations that uh, Ned supports, or you know, the 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 countries in the region. Um, but I mean, that that tells you a little bit. You know, we 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 work to defend democracy, and oftentimes, uh, because of authoritarian influence and democratic backsliding, uh, it's very hard for journalism to be sustainable. Uh, so. I guess um, in terms of like online publications, like it, it's no surprise that, you know, that is sort of, especially in closed or repressive states that online uh, publications are a better outlet, uh, are a better method, you know, instead of print. Uh, that said, they come with their own challenges in terms of surveillance and um, digital repression or digital policies that can undermine on online publications. So in terms of how, you know, Netsy support, um, some of the things you know that characteristics of some of the online publications that we support are innovative reporting methods, right? There are some uh, there are notable outlets in Latin America and Africa, especially, who are using encrypt encrypted messaging apps as one tool of news dissemination, right? As a way to circumvent um, internet shutdowns um, and uh, you know, uh, again, digital policies that are not working in their favor. So using an encrypted messaging app like uh, Signal or WhatsApp can actually be a really effective tool to disseminate your information in a space where, um, like in a closed space, um, especially, you know, there are other organizations, I can't, I can't speak about, uh, you know, name them, but um, maybe not an online form, but, you know, when you work in a repressive state, uh, you know, you really have to get creative in the way that you publish your news. So whether that's, you know, in flyers, uh, you know, covered, you know, with like a, you know, in a different way. So your readers understand that you're giving news, but then the government does not, um, you know, doesn't know that it's actually news that's being disseminated to the community. Um, other really excellent tools for, uh, or like things to consider about digital publications are, and if you haven't heard about them, are like trust initiatives. So um, uh, initiatives like the Journalism Trust Initiative um, and NewsGuard are ways for on audiences who interact, you know, with online publications to see if um, it's got like a media literacy tool to see that the the what you're consuming on tech platforms is actually trustworthy. So these trust initiatives, you know, and that's something that you know that you know does support. Um, uh, not those specific, but just like trust initiative. That's another way for, you know, when you think about um, publications. 
Um, generally, I mean, online publications, just as much as print um, and legacy media are really, str are really struggling, especially now at the, like with the questionable never curious relationship that big tech and tech platforms have with that um, in terms of advertising right of a new and, um, you know, sometimes fake laws, you know, that are don't work that work against sorry fake news laws that are working against uh digital outlets i mean i can say a lot to this but generally what you want when we support independent media um in the digital space is for it to be sustainable you know to take media literacy into account um and to be innovative uh, to make sure that they are able to work in these repressive and clo closed environments appreciate that thanks very much for that answer andrea i now have a question from uh our dean for for all three of you uh, uh, a question that many workers are um, are interested in, but certainly um, I think is a particular issue for um, people who are just entering the workforce and maybe who are relatively new in the workforce who are maybe starting to um, uh, push back the boundaries or um, establish better boundaries between work and uh, other life. And so the Dean asks, given your work schedules, is it possible to have work-life balance? Let's start from the top with Jesse. Uh, I think it depends on the, the job, but my job specifically, I would say yes. Uh, one cool thing about uh, my team is we all work set shifts. Um, so I don't actually have to answer emails after I clock out every day. Um, we fill out timesheets uh, nice. like the good old days. Um, so if you're like, if, uh, if, it's, it's a good option if you want to be able to shut your computer and not have to answer calls. And so you actually have clear weekends. Yeah. Um, it, even like if someone, it, my team is different and like is, is special in the newsroom, but like if someone reaches out like three minutes after my shift is over, I'm not answering them. Like it's like that hard and because if I'm not getting paid, I'm not, I'm not going to work. Wow, fantastic. I'm so Damn. jealous of Jesse. <laughs> I thought you might be. I'm like, oh, what do I have to do to get one of those jobs? Um, but I yeah, no, I have a very different uh reality. I, you know, I've had to write stories like on at 11 p.m. on a Saturday night, uh, when news breaks. I've had to kind of um jump on a plane unexpectedly over the weekend, um, more times than I can count even this year. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's tough. And then you end up, you know, like having to kind of answer edits or you end up realizing that, you know, there's only certain things you can only do on the weekends or whatever. Uh, it's, it's kind of just a part of, part of the job. But I think one thing that's helped me is really, um, taking like not ever, I mean, I, I need to get better about this and listen to my own advice, but, um, taking comp days when you're, when you're, when you, uh, you know, deserve them when you've worked a weekend, like really, uh, making sure to then, you know, take that day when you need it. Uh, you know, I, I have been, I think my first couple of years in, in this, you know, in, in journalism, I didn't take all of my vacations for some reason. I just kind of felt like guilty about asking for days off or like, I don't know, it, but I, I started realizing like I have to take every single vacation because I, you know, if you don't, you will burn out. Like you need that time. And, and I think it's helped me to really, you know, when I'm on vacation, like really take the vacation. Like one thing I'm trying to do this year has been like when I'm on, you know, when I'm on vacation, I'm, I, I've been trying to plan trips so I can be like without reception, without, you know, um, in the middle of nowhere where it's truly not possible for me to answer. Um, you know, just really trying to kind of, enjoy the time when you're not uh, supposed to be working and, you know, take the time you need to, uh, you know, and, and get into a routine. I think it really helps to also have a routine. Like I've been trying to do like morning hikes um, and, you know, to find those ways to kind of like relieve stress uh, when you can. And I think that also really helps with that work-life balance. Yeah, so you could say I left journalism for a reason, um, but no, I mean, so when I was working in journalism, I, I, I think what compounded, I, yeah, I was working really, really long days. Um, it was also compounded with like working at a very strict Japanese culture, you know, where it's known for, you know, a lot, a lot of work. Um, and then add to the fact that I'm also covering foreign policy that affects Japan. So if the prime minister of Japan suddenly resigns or passes away, which, you know, was the case um, in the past couple of years. Um, 
I have to, you know, be able to be able to reach the White House for a comment at like 1 a.m., um, you know, and I get that phone call. So it's it's tricky. But I mean, again, when you work in journalism, at least what I found, um, it's like I at least I lived on the adrenaline for a lot uh, of it. And it really kind of keeps you going. But it is so important to have to set aside those moments. You know, like I found like running in the morning really helped me or um, especially yeah, take your vacation time. I just found out that it's not like I think the U.S., um, it's one of the countries where like workers actually don't take all their vacation time in comparison to other uh, countries in the world. So, you know, if you have a good relationship with your editors and uh, the chiefs, uh, the bureau chiefs, just, you know, put your vacation time ahead of time. Um, like if you can do it, you know, months in advance, you can say, look, for this week, I'm going to be out. So if like a major news event is going to be taking place that week, like you have already told them that you're going to be out and you're in the mountains with no reception. Um, that said, again, a, a career in media doesn't mean that you have to be in the newsroom. I right now work a very, very healthy nine to five. Um, at 4.30, my colleagues are telling me to have a nice night. So it's very, very refreshing. Thank you for those answers. Um, really enjoying the conversation this evening. Um, we have uh, about 20 minutes left or so. Um, and so I wanna encourage uh, folks, if you're out there in the audience, um, particularly students, um, to use that Q&A. Uh, box to submit a question or two. We have a couple more and I have a couple more, um, but you're welcome to uh, to weigh in with your own questions. Um, let's see, I'm going to go to, one of them just disappeared. Um, I'm going to ask uh, a, um, a question about uh, advice. And a couple of uh, you did uh, in your introductory remarks talk about um, advice to students, but I want to get more um, specific about it, um, particularly from the perspective that you have now um, with a few years uh, working as professionals under your belts. Um, so looking back over it, if you can, and thinking about your 18-year-old selves, what, what advice can you think of that you would give to that um, freshman starting out in Bloomington, um, you know, based on being in the news business for now three or six years, uh, as the case may be. I gave, I think I gave Jesse the first really hard question and maybe this is a hard one. So I'm gonna go in reverse order here and I'll ask this one to Andrea first. Apply to everything, uh, you know, whether that's internships or opportunities that come from the media school, just apply to everything. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it, uh, you know, like, and again, okay, yeah. So apply to everything. I know it's tedious, but really do that. And then two, if there is, um, if you're applying to the Washington Post, for example, right, and you attended this panel, and you know <laughs> that's I'm putting Sam on the spot right now, but like all to say that use the Hoosier connections. Like I surprised myself being in D.C. by the amount of uh, alumni from Indiana that work here in all sectors, especially, but especially journalism. Um, we have a really, really strong cohort and no IU alumni is going to turn you away. So whether you reach out to them on LinkedIn or Twitter and say, hey, I just need 15 minutes of your time to basically tell me if I'm going to like the internship or job that I apply to. Those 15 minutes can be life-changing, right? Because if you make a good impression, that person's going to go and flag your resume with the human resources department. Um, third is use your professors as resources, right? They are the professors in the field that they are because they are well connected in this industry. Um, if you, those, you know, they can point you to other alumni and they can point you to other resources and opportunities, you know, use them. They are experts in this field, again, for a reason. So those are just my three tidbits. Thanks, Andrea. How about you, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I'd really echo what um, Andrea said about you know, using your connections and staying in touch with them. Um, you know, well, for example, I definitely am happy and eager to talk to anyone on this call, but uh, and I'm uh, you know always uh, excited to talk to to other IU people. Uh, I, I feel like most journalists are kind of obsessed with talking about their jobs, <laughs> so most people will say yes um, if they have the time, you know. And I think um, something that really helped me when I was in college was staying in touch with the people who gave me internships in the past. Uh, you know, if there's a for example, like. I think a key reason why I got the New York Times internship was because um, the person who ran it at the time, uh, he ended up at Rich Jones, if anyone ever comes across that man, he's just a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, he's now, um, yeah, he's he's worn a lot of hats in this industry, but he, uh, you know, I remember staying in touch with him after I had that like two week um, 
uh, camp thing with the New York Times Institute. And I remember sending him my, my clips over the course of the year. I'd be like, hey, I just wrote the story, you know, in the IDS or hope you're doing well. Like, I just wanted to share this, like, you know, the story I worked on, I was really proud of, you know, stay in touch and kind of like, they want to see those things. And, and then by the time they're looking through the stack of, of uh, applications, they're like, oh, I totally know this person and I've read their work and they've been really productive this year. Um, they've grown in this in this way. Um, so yeah, and, and really like when ask for feedback um, during your internships too, to, to make sure that there are things that, like I remember have, you know, trying asking for like that middle of the summer meeting with my my manager and asking like what are the things that can improve on like you know really make the most of those internships because those are the things that are going to get you jobs and remember that you know you don't need to come up with like the biggest investigation in the world in those internships you don't need to bite off more than you can chew but you do need to come away with it with a few different things you're really proud of um so just try to focus on like making the most of those internships and those connections um and I will say one thing that is always tricky in journalism school um, that I think I remember early on feeling a bit overwhelmed by all of the pressure. Maybe this has changed a bit now, but at the time, a lot of pressure to be able to do it all, right? Like you have to be able to do social media and video and photo and design and, you know, all of that stuff. And like, I am glad I got that like breadth of kind of the broad, the broad skill set. And I, you know, I do occasionally have to like take some videos on my phone or, or know how to navigate, um, kind of the digital sphere, but I'm really glad I kind of stuck with what I loved, which for me from day one was writing. Like I, I knew, and I was lucky. Not a lot of people know what they exactly what they want to do right, right away. Um, and that's fine. It, it might take you some time to figure that out, but if there's something you really love the most, it, like, I don't think, don't shy away from sticking with it and specializing and finding your niche. You know, if you're like, I really love writing about video games. Like we have a video game platform. We have a vertical for video games at the Washington Post. And you know who they want to hire? That person who has spent like most of their, you know, college career writing about video games. Like if there's something you love, like, don't be afraid to kind of, um, you know, kind of go tunnel vision on, on that to some extent, because that could really help you stand out. Um, so that's kind of what I did with writing and, and working in kind of with covering uh, international uh, issues. And it, it, I think really helped out. I just want to jump in quickly and say SEMA where I work now is actually an intern also one of the many internships I had. And I stayed in touch with, you know, my mentors and they were the ones that reached out to me and said, because I did exactly that. I stayed in touch with them. I had coffee with them once and I was in DC. Um, but also again, just quickly, um, like this goes beyond the internships that you have as a student. Like while I was um, at NHK and was actively looking to, you know, for other opportunities, I found, um, IU, um, I found Hoosiers in DC that worked at other publications and I, you know, stayed in touch with them and sent them all my reels and clips. And, you know, that ultimately that's not the direction that I wanted to, but that I really made some really strong connections after graduation because I took the advice that I would as an 18 year old. Great. That's great advice from um, both of you. Um, so, so Jesse, uh, what would the 18 year old uh, Jesse, um, uh, benefit from hearing from the 25-ish year old, Jesse? It's tough to go after they both just gave like really good advice. <laughs> and like I, I, I like I, all the things that I had like written down, like they said. Um, uh, I would say, uh, I would tell 18-year-old Jesse to start at the IDS sooner. Um, I think that I thought that I was going to get a feel for journalism from journalism classes. Um, journalism classes are great. Obviously, this is a media school event, so I'm not <laughs> not crapping on journalism classes. But um, uh, sometimes they feel a little uh, like it's it's a bit of a a clinical uh, experience as opposed to like a hands on one. I don't know if I use that word correctly, but uh, um, you have to like I think make yourself a little uncomfortable by doing something you're not familiar with in order to get a sense of what you like. Um, another thing um, that I think is actually pretty important for success in journalism is having interests and friends outside of journalism. Uh, I think you're much less likely to get burnt out that way. Um, I don't get me wrong, my IDS friends are like my best friends from college, but like um, I think that I wish I'd spent a little less time in the newsroom. I mean, like if you're not spending any time in there, that's not good. But um, I I'm more interested in my work when I have time away from it, if that makes sense. Um, cause it, it kind of sucks to like graduate from school. And then a couple of years later realize 
uh, that your like only personality is your job and like what you studied in school. Um, so yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if any of that's good. Yeah, no, that's very good advice. Thank you for that. Um, I, I would just add that, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, references to the IDS here. And um, I know there are students in the audience who uh, maybe they, maybe the IDS is not their thing. We certainly have student media opportunities that, um, uh, you know, are um, in broadcast and in, in digital. Um, we now have an investigative center that students can work in. So there are many opportunities for students to to jump on, um, just kind of an important thing to, to find one of those things and uh, latch on and uh, make connections, network, get experience um, using those student media opportunities, whether it's IDS or um, WIUX or something like that. Uh, so I'll just slip that little plug in there. And, and don't forget about those great journalism classes that are more conceptual than, than hands-on. I teach a few of those myself. Uh, but I appreciate your comment uh, there, Jesse. So um, I think we'll, we're gonna have time for two more questions. I've got a good question from a student here uh, for the penultimate question. Uh, it says, uh, and I'm glad uh, that you brought this up. Uh, Jocelyn, I will say your name, a uh, good student of mine, uh, because we also have uh, people perhaps in the audience who are public relations uh, majors. We're a media school. We have a lot of different majors. Uh, many of whom are not just going into uh, news and editorial. Um, so from that side of the uh, the divide comes this question. A lot of journalism majors, including me, have concentrations in public relations. Do you interact with PR practitioners frequently? What is that relationship like? Or do you have to do any PR work yourself? Open to anyone. Um, I don't work with PR professionals, but I was a PR concentration. So just wanted to plug in that, you know, a lot of the work in the classes that I took, especially those last two, uh, I'm blanking on campaigns and research, um, especially research. They do a lot, like there was a lot, at least when I took it, there was a lot of focus on like qualitative and quantitative research that you can do, you know, in terms of like in digital media. And that has been very helpful for me now, um, you know, as you know, I do a lot of research in the work that I am now. Um, so not really answering your question, but just to say that like the, the skills that I had as a public uh, relations concentration uh, are useful in the media adjacent and also media field. I probably talk to someone in the public relations sphere every day, um, you know, even maybe without even realizing it. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, a lot of the people I interact with, you know, who handle, uh, you know, especially here trying to kind of get a hold of politicians and trying to, you know, get, uh, get a hold of anyone, you have to go through public relations people. And uh, so I have very, I have great appreciation for really good ones. And I get really frustrated by ones that, you know, ref refuse to work with me, <laughs> um, or who don't really understand what I do. Like, I think it's, it's really hard uh, I, I think some of the best public relations people I know, um, some of the best communicators for different companies or, you know, um, organizations, they were either former journalists or, you know, have a really good sense of what journalism means and what you do. And they realize that like working with you is to their benefit. Um, giving you the access is, is, uh, you know, could only in, in many cases benefit. Um, I mean, I obviously am biased because I'm the one trying to get the access. I'm sure your PR professor teachers might tell you differently, but, um, but no, I, I think that like the, I have such an appreciation for it. And I also, um, have started having to kind of navigate some of that as well. Like work a lot with our PR people at the post, we have like a whole PR team and they're the ones that help like coordinate radio interviews. Like when I'm asked to do, um, radio or TV interviews, like we had a lot of them during the elections here and, you know, they're so helpful at like, you know, managing those telling me like this is a good one a good interview to do this one's maybe you know like can skip it or whatever um and like i know so like if you're interested in if you're one of those people that likes pr but also likes being at a newspaper i know like there are places like the post like have a whole team for that um and they you know are so helpful so i think yeah i just like really appreciate you <laughs> even though i can't entirely uh relate to it Thank you, Sam. Want to weigh on this one, Jesse? Have you had any PR experiences or uh, encounters with PR people? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't say that I like do PR, although I do a lot of other things on the back end at Politico. Um, but it, like when I write about, like when I'm writing and reporting, uh, which I get to do on the side, um, I, I, I'm in contact with comms people and PR people all the time. Um, people, I, I get a lot of like PR pitches that don't seem well targeted to me, but those aside, I really like, I mean, I had a bunch of PR friends when I was at IU. Um, and for the most part, I, I think that people in PR understand uh, where journalists are coming from and we kind of know what their role is as well. Um, so I think it's a, it's a good uh, symbiotic relationship. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for those answers. And thank you for that question. Um, I'm glad we got to that one. Um, so I want to close, we're running out of time here, and I want to close with, uh, uh, you know, one of those stereotypical questions that's also just a really good question um, uh, for this uh, audience, which is, um, you know, prospective, you know, students who um, are thinking about um, starting their careers and, um, you know, sort of future oriented. So I want you to think into the future now. I asked you to think back to being 18. Now I want, to I want you to think about being, uh, you know, 30 or, or 33, whatever the case may be. And tell me and tell our audience where you see yourself, what you see yourself doing professionally, either inside journalism or, or out of it in, in five years or so. And maybe we'll start uh, in the the same rotation we did at the top with uh, starting with Jesse. That's a tough one. Um, if you'd asked me like three years ago, I would have I would have a very different answer. Um, I would actually have an answer. Honestly, I don't I don't even I haven't really thought about it. Um, and I think that trying to like predetermine or like have expectations about where I'll be or what I'll be doing. Um, might do me more damage than good, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, like there are things I'd like to be doing, but I, I, <laughs> um, uh, I, I'd like to be writing for a national audience five years from now. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. That's that's tough. I guess I don't think about my future much. <laughs> I mean, I might fall. be, yeah, I might be a bad person to <laughs> have on this panel. No, no, this is uh, very enlightening and interesting. I will do a quick follow up with you, though, since you said, had I asked you this question three years ago, you would have had an answer. What would your answer have been then? I would probably would have been more confident about what I just said about things I'd like to be doing. Um, I thought I was a lot, I think I was a lot more sure of what I was doing. Um, I haven't had much control over my career in the period since the pandemic started. Um, that not to take any agency away from myself, but uh, I haven't had as much control as I did before. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, uh, pandemic has uh, has thrown a wrench in so many uh, in so many aspirations. Although I I, I will say that um, many people, certainly coming out of college, have that sense of. Uh, not as much agency as they would like, but that's really interesting. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate you letting me put you on the spot there a little bit too. Uh, Sam, what do you think? I, I also feel like if you would have asked me this, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of in this weird space now because I've, I've spent most of my, my life since I can remember wanting to do exactly this. And I've only ever had like this mission as be a foreign correspondent. Um, and now that I'm here, I'm kind of like, I was waiting to see kind of if I liked it, if I was burnt out by it, I think I'm still waiting to see if I'm burnt out by it, um, in a few years, but you know, I, I think one thing that has surprised me about this job is like, I'm, you know, I just kind of want to learn more and I want to see more. I, I feel like, like the clock is ticking. I've already been here for a year and like, I've gotten to, to do a lot and travel a lot, but there's so much more I want to learn. And like every, you know time I kind of uh, dive into a different country, I realize how little I know about it and how much I want to keep kind of understanding it. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of like, I, I'm, I wanna stay here as long as the post will let me because I, uh, I really want to kind of see and learn as much as I can in, in South America. And I feel like so lucky and like there's, you know no other time in my life when I'm gonna be able to just kind of like get on a plane in the middle of the night or whatever. <laughs> um, but I do think that so much of that can kind of ebb and flow. And I think 
I don't know, one thing I'm trying to do less of is like have such a clear path and I'm kind of open to, you know, seeing, you know, maybe I will want to go back to DC and, and be a reporter there. Maybe I'll want to, you know, move to a different country. Maybe I'll want to learn Portuguese or, you know, pick up my Arabic or, you know, but I, I think that, uh, I think it, it, I'm trying to kind of keep, keep my options open and just also see how I feel and, and not be so rigid as I have been my whole life of like, this is the, this is the goal and I have to do everything to get there. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Andrea. Um, yeah. Uh, in five years, um, I, I like what I do now. I, and I would like to, you know, in five years still be doing what I do now. And what that is, is, you know, supporting independent media and promoting media development. Um, I think it's important to have, you know, to think about the back end of journalism again. So people like Jesse and Sam can report and do the work that they want. Um, specifically, I think that it really interests me that, you know, so much, like, when you think about like governments, philanthropies, there's just so many stakeholders that are investing both financially and operationally in independent media around the world, especially in developing countries. And I want to be part of making sure that that assistance, whether it's financial or operational or capacity driven, is effective, right? That people aren't just like talking up money because, oh, someone said that, you know, we should be paying attention to press freedom because of all of these demoralizing statistics. No, like the money that is going, not just money again, like so the support and the capacity and the money that is going to independent media needs to be effective, you know, needs to be demand driven, needs to be, you know, dictated by what the newsrooms want and not just all these actors at the top telling, saying, um, you know, telling newsrooms what they need. Great, thank you. Well, this has been, I, I really appreciate those answers. This has been a wonderful conversation, uh, pretty wide ranging, I think. I really am i um, thankful for the audience who's uh, stayed with us through the hour and a half and uh, contributed some really great questions. And I um, uh, would like to thank the media school and the NHJ chapter and the students there for supporting this event. And of course, really pleased that um, Jesse Naranjo, Samantha Schmidt, Andrea uh, Vega Uticok, that you, you all could join us and uh, generously share your time with us. And we would love to have you back to campus. Come please visit us sometime and let us know uh, when you have an opportunity to do that. So thank you all again. And uh, thank you in the audience and everyone have a great evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. So long everyone. Yes, thanks. <laughs>